Hello, I'm here to talk about the business benefits of research. It's incredibly important that the architecture profession gets its brain around the way it deals with knowledge, as knowledge and information are going to be completely fundamental to the way that the profession goes forward into the future. The context that we're in is really interesting at the moment because the creative industries as a whole, that's gaming industries, web design, apps, all those sort of things, they've moved ahead from the financial services to become the greatest generator of gross domestic product for the British economy. But oddly enough, architecture has barely moved in terms of value added, the way that the government um, assesses its importance. So architecture is really starting to lag behind. Now, at the same time, you've got countries like Korea investing 4.15% of their gross domestic product in research and innovation. Uh, Sweden is investing 3.3%. And this is, you can see it in Sweden in the way that they are investing in fab labs, in tech industries, startups, all these kinds of things are happening everywhere because the Swedish government is so alive to their potential. In the UK, we're only investing 1.63% in research and you can bet your bottom dollar that quite a lot of that is invested in the arms industry. So we need to re raise the profile of the built environment of construction, energy, well-being, all these really key issues um, for the future of our country. So having said this, there are huge opportunities out there. So at the moment, there's 80 billion euros available to do research. There are research projects starting up all over Britain, uh, well, all over Europe, involving wide ranges of researchers, very often working in conjunction with small to medium sized practices. But hardly any of those projects involve architects. So we're really missing a trick on that particular opportunity. So unless architecture practice adapts to the challenges of disruptive technology, they are going to disappear. I think they're going to disappear or they're going to take on a radically different form. And the success of architectural practice will increasingly be based on the way in which it utilises the information economy to generate business benefits. So here's a slide that shows really some of the threats to small practices and large ones too. But I'm sure they're things, they're things for which most of you are tremendously familiar. We did a project at the RABA on the state of research in housing practice and it showed that 43% of architects do believe themselves to be doing research but actually 99% of them believe that research was a really good thing especially from a client point of view. Now the one kind of research we could all be doing, the one kind of research that would make a tremendous difference is building performance evaluation. Now this doesn't have to be about energy or technology, it can also be about um, how much people enjoy the building, how good it is for um, the business environment. It can feed into all sorts of things. And if you have a practice, a particular practice brand or something that you want to show that you're really good at, you should be do doing building performance evaluation to show that you are good at it with some kind of evidence that is, that is plausible, that seems convincing. And that doesn't have to be quantitative. It can be quantitative statistics or it can be qualitative in terms of endorsements and so on. So apparently only 3% of architectural practices in Britain are doing building performance evaluation and that is an extremely troubling statistic. There, the practices that are doing building performance evaluation repeatedly say how advantageous it has been to their whole operation. So the business benefits of research are manifold. It helps you to develop a unique and relevant practice brand. It will help you to diversify your services. It's not just about building buildings anymore. It will give, help you generate evidence of the value of your services to your client, to yourself, to society. It will help you develop new income streams. It will help give strategic focus to your office, the way you work, the way you invest in people and in stuff, in kit and so on. <clears throat> it will help you reduce your risk, the risk of your own operation, it will, the risk of your client's operation. If you have no about how things are going to perform, then it's going to reduce risk enormously. And it also offers a whole range of other wider benefits to society. 
And what's more, research is fun. Research is exciting. Research is intellectually stimulating. So in terms of practice brand, one um, architectural practice that has really done a great job in using research to articulate its practice is Jan Gale's office in Denmark, Gale Architects. And the government in Denmark will say that this office has made a tremendous difference to the way that they have worked with the city and has helped them to make Denmark the most livable city in the world. So Gale Architects have articulated their whole offer around research and they're now done so well in it, they're starting up the Gale Institute in New York to develop this further and to enter the US market. Now, other practices that are um, research orientated, well, here's Foster and Partners, potentially one of the most successful practices in Britain. What do they have on their website? They say, we design by researching and challenging by asking the right questions. They know that putting the word research up there up front offers a really powerful uh, pull to their clients. And of completely the other end of the spectrum, here are Urbed, who are fantastic at participatory architectural research and working with communities. Well, that's their practice band. That is their specialism. Visioning the future of communities is what they do. Um, so there's a whole range of practices that, that have developed brands around their research. This links very closely to the diversification of services. Now, we're all familiar with the RABA plan of work, but actually, it's not just about the building of buildings from one to seven. Stage zero, the pre-planning, the research, there are so many potential jobs to be unpacked, to be taken out of that stage, which you can be offering to your client and articulating potentially with its own fee attached. Similarly, at the other end, the building in use, soft landings, helping people to use their buildings. There's a whole raft of new services at that end as well. And there are increasingly architects who are doing those jobs and they're getting paid for it. And I just put forward this slide, which is, comes from Sebastian Conran's uh, um, um, website. Well, he's a product designer. He designs, say, Nigella Lawson's cookware. But he sells each stage of the design process and he sets it out. And people are very, very clear about what they're getting when they are getting his services. And I don't think we take apart what, our, what we do offer. We don't take it apart, we don't articulate it, we don't say it's important, and we don't get paid for it. So these are really, really key things that we have to learn from other industries. In terms of diversification of services, Zero Zero uh, are a practice that have really done a fantastic job in becoming um, almost like, market, not, like management consultants. They help organisations to articulate who they are, their identity and where they want to go. Zero Zero are strongly influenced by big practices in the past like DGW. Um, but they have, so they've got a very, very unique offer and a very unique bunch of services coming through. Evidence value, I've also men already mentioned how key that is. This is a report we did on the, we looked at all sorts of industry documents trying to find the evidence of the value that architects added to the world and we found almost nothing. But this is not that the value doesn't exist, it doesn't exist in a form that we can take to policymakers and do business with. And this is why firms like Archetype, who are so clever because they are using building performance to such a, um, an excellent degree, they're repeating, they're refining their buildings, they're almost getting to the point that they can offer a guarantee of performance. Um, this is why these kind of uh, practices are so important. This is why building performance evaluation is so important. So I mentioned diversification. This leads, of course, to new income streams. And when you get involved in research, you start seeing that it's not just the building, the project that matters. It's the way you approach the project or the building, the methodology used. That has market value. And nobody's done this better than Gary, who's just who set up a whole business around leveraging income from the way he designed buildings. 
from the way they use information and the way they generate forms. So you know, take inspiration from Gary, who's, who's a magnificent business architect. But there are other practices at a very different kind of spectrum. Here's Sarah Wigglesworth, Sarah Wigglesworth Architects, who has um, gained over a million pounds funding, working with consortia team on design for ageing. So that'll help her articulate her practice as a real leader in the world of ageing design. And here's other, other kind of practices, uh, doing research projects. This one is an image from a film made by Ash Sackular Architects, who did a research project on motivating collective custom build. This made them experts in the, in the arena of custom build and also then led them to be designing one of the custom built packages for Igloo's pro, um, development down in Cornwall because of this expertise that they generated. So this is the way that research pump primes other activities. Research also allows you access to clients, to new people, to new audiences, as Ash Sackular found when they were doing this project. So it's not just about new income, it's new knowledge streams, new exposures. And to do research, you can get tax credits. The tax credit scheme, you might even find that you can pay entire staff in your practice out of the benefits that you can get from classifying some of your activities as research and development, as I'm sure they are. They, I'm sure they are research and development. So there are many practices in Britain now that have staff paid through the tax credit scheme. So strategic focus. If you think about research, you have to spend quite a lot of time thinking about where your practice is going, what it's doing. The really troubling thing is that it seems that 60% of architects don't actually have a business plan, which is something unheard of in other businesses and other kind of professions. It means that architects are not strategizing for the way that they use resource, and they're not strategizing about the direction that they want their practice to take. This leaves the ones who have, the, the ones who have gotten a business plan it leaves them in a very, very good position. And I can tell you that they are getting more aggressive and they are going to start stealing the territories of other architects very, very rapidly. It's not, it's, it's, um, survival is going to be a large issue, I think. So, the development of research and the development of business strategy go hand in hand. Research requires targeted investment. Small businesses suffer from four challenges, and this is some research done by Lou and Sexton, who've spent a lot of time looking at small practices and the way they deal with knowledge. They su small businesses suffer from a shortage of appropriate skilled staff. They suffer from very little resource being allocated to external relations, meaning that the flow of knowledge back and forth within the practice is limited. They're not getting out there and they're not learning and they're not putting what they've learned in practice out there. Small businesses uh, are, are very often dominated by the owner or management team who themselves may have very poor strategic skills. At the same time, small businesses suffer because the cash flow for ongoing investment doesn't happen because the way that the finances work in the practice is based on individual projects. But money has to be set aside for investment in knowledge. And there are certain practices that I know of that have a kind of Google Friday where they allow their staff to invest in projects, to explore projects way off piece from the practice. Research reduces risk. Clients are risk averse, I'm sure you all know. Delivering believable documentation of positive results obtained for past clients can entirely in increase your chance of getting a job. And research um, also suggests that people are not so excited by creativity. What they really want is lack of risk. In many, many uh, clients I've spoken to, they think the good design is a given. What they want is lack of risk. So, but research de-risks innovation. It makes it possible to do exciting new things. And responsible research practice has reputational benefits and can impact positively on all sorts of things. But it can, all, it can impact on your personal indemnity insurance in a positive way. It shows you're a responsible human being. It can impact on your building warranties because Building warranties very often take into account kind of no claims bonus system so that if you're making less mistakes or working responsibly, you pay less or for the warranty. It can also impact on pre-qualification questionnaires and bidding for projects. So doing research helps with all of that.
So these things are incredibly important. And I think increasingly other professions, such as the engineers, they're recognising the importance of ethical practice and of ethical risk and of reputational risk. So that's why they've, delivered, they've produced an ethics toolkit to help practitioners to work in a kind of ethical way. And I think this is going to become more and more prevalent. So to conclude, research and practice is not just about benefit, business benefits, although it has huge benefits. It's about reducing waste. It's about helping the environment and about helping society. All those reasons why I'm sure you went into architecture in the first place. It stops architects having to reinvent the wheel. Architects reinvent the wheel constantly. And what a terrible waste of energy that is. It makes practice more exciting. It makes it intellectually stimulating. It makes it fulfilling. It enables you to get out there, share with your peers and colleagues in industry and beyond what is good about your work and why others should learn from it. So it's a very exciting story. And crucially, it provides evidence of the value of our profession. And we really need that evidence right now. If you want any information on any of the background of any of this, go and have a look at this book, Demystifying Architectural Research, Adding Value to Your Practice. It has a lot of leads, how to go about going for research. How, and most crucially, it's got a lot of really, really nice examples of other practices doing research, which hopefully will provide you with inspiration. So please do make space for ideas in your practice, because this is going to be the best way for all of us, for practices, the profession and society.